solid. We are just, this has been in the works since like late COVID ISO. And we are about to interview my girlfriend, Elizabeth, who resides in Dubai um, and Julie Bishop. Okay. Hi. 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 I'm nervous. Don't be nervous. I'm nervous. I'm sweating. Like, I don't know why I wore leather. I am legit sweating. Mm. I think that what we do need to acknowledge and for people watching this episode is the fact that not all two people think the same and nor do all yeah. two, two people have the same opinions. And that's actually what makes and that's this, okay. this platform super unique. And yeah. what makes all of us unique as people is the fact that there are varying opinions and stuff. And at the end of the day, we are having on people who inspire us and who <clears throat> can give us advice to be better in our day to day lives. And with that, yeah. M, we are having on, drum roll, Julie Bishop. OMG, fangirl, fangirl. Elizabeth, yeah. Elizabeth fangirl. Donald. So, um, backstory, I, get, I, don't, I don't need to do a huge introduction about Julie Bishop. Everyone knows who she is. Um, the connection though is Elizabeth, I met four years ago through work and we naturally got along so well. We were both interested in, we we're both interested in country music and foreign affairs and we just got along really well and we've kept in touch. So I guess we accept them in the Zoom. In the Zoom. Come yeah, let's do this. All right, is everyone ready? Oh my God. All right, bring him so. in. Hi guys. How are you? I've got a new home studio. I've got playing around with it all. So you've already done better than I have, which is trying to get uh, internet working better in the Barrable Hills, getting a kid down and not having a microphone working on the computer. So <laughs> and you kind of look like you're in a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and Elizabeth, you're in Dubai. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm actually in like an hour out of Dubai. I'm in Russell Kama. It's a different Emirate who um, obviously fostered a friendship through your work in the Liberal Party. What was it that started your friendship and, and drew you both towards each other? At one point, Elizabeth actually came out and helped me campaign in Melbourne. But I just loved her adventurous spirit. Uh, I loved the fact that she was always up for any crazy thing that I had in mind. And we've had such fun together, whether it's in Australia or overseas. I mean, remember the time I got you to come along to the Sydney to Hobart when I had to jump off the back of a yacht. <laughs> oh my gosh. On the, on the way down to Hobart, and I came back, and Elizabeth was on board the sponsor's yacht having a few glasses of wine, and I come in like a bedraggled cat. <laughs> She's just a free spirit, a lot of fun, and I really enjoy her company. Of course, Julie is such an icon in Australia, and, and we see her in such serious. Um, in such a serious role as she's been in, so I get to see the, the fun part. Yeah, uh, I feel like I feel like we've kind of got to see that. I'm sure you have a lot of stories you <laughs> could potentially <laughs> share. <laughs> yeah, we've got a few, but was there ever a part during your career in politics where you had to consider what you would wear? I, I think people in the public eye uh, always have to be conscious of how they appear and particularly as foreign minister, I was representing Australia on the international stage. So I was very conscious of dressing appropriately and uh, often in Australian designers so that if people did comment, as they invariably did, about what I was wearing, I mean, it just goes with the territory. Of course. I'd also be promoting Australian fashion. So yes, I was conscious of what I was wearing. There were other times when I subconsciously would wear something that would then generate its own headlines. Indeed, the pair of red shoes that I wore on the day I resigned as foreign minister kind of took on a life of their own. That these sparkly Dorothy, hey Toto, we're not in Kansas. <laughs> yeah, and they ended up in the Australian Museum of Democracy as kind of a statement or a symbol of the times. What's your favorite city um, to visit? God, that's like, what's your favorite child? You know what I mean? Um, Everywhere Definitely has its own yeah. <laughs> you know, wonderful points. I'm, I'm very loyal to Nashville because it's such a dynamic city. I mean, I lived in LA for a really long time. I love New York and obviously Dubai is, is its home. Yeah. When, when you live abroad and you spend time in different countries, as, as I'm sure you guys know, you know, it's, it's always nice to come back to that Australian yeah. ethos 
um, that perhaps is lacking in different in different countries. Especially, you know, as what's going overseas at the moment, especially in America, um, yeah. you know, makes you realise that Australia is a very, very lucky place to be. Yeah, notwithstanding Australia's, you know, issues that probably has in common with the US in, in one yeah. way, shape or another, but um, certainly for my friends that are in the US at the moment, and I've got a lot of friends that are in the US, um, that are both part of, of the, the black um, community and it's just it's just a it's both a heartbreaking time and also a time of such great celebration I guess it's almost a, a revolution. Do you find being a really progressive female living where you in do little, now? Yeah. Um, it's it's funny that you ask that because I think a lot of people do have that perhaps you know, the Western narrative of the Middle East has always been that the Middle East is a, is a suppressed place for women. But if you look at it, and I'm not ta I'm talking from a United Arab Emirates standpoint, I can't comment on the Arab world and the GCC as a whole. It's such a, a vast place with different countries with different rules and regulations. But in terms of the Emirates, I mean, to, to begin with, it's roughly about 87% expat at the moment. Wow. So every every culture, every creed, you know, it's it's right. everyone in the Middle pot together. Secondly, uh, the the president <clears throat> of the United Arab Emirates, Sheikh Mohammed um, Al Nahan, he has made it so that women, I think it's currently maybe 60, 65 percent um, that the government in the public sector is female driven. So anyone who wants to talk about that the Emirates is a suppressed or a place for women, I think that that is really misinformed. And Julie, question for you. Obviously, you've been an absolute icon and a woman of firsts for our nation. How did you find being one of the most powerful voices in the country in a room full of men? Well, throughout my professional career, I've been one of a few women in particular roles. I first started my legal career back in the late 70s and I was the first woman to be employed by my law firm. That's been perhaps the story of my career and then when I went into politics there were more women coming into politics federally but the whole um, parliamentary system, the procedures, the conventions, the customs were determined at a time when there were really only men in the federal parliament. So it's taken a long time for there to be uh, an approach that is much more embracing and engaging for women. Uh, when women are the first to take on a particular role, then they have a responsibility to make it easier for the next woman coming along, not harder. But it can be rather intimidating at times to be the only female in a room of men. I remember mm. being at a conference in 2016 it was a, a global conference at the united nations in new york and there were 27 foreign ministers at this table of uh, coalition members on the war against terror and i just noted that i was the only female in the room and i thought wow here we are in 2016 yeah, well. some of the most powerful people in the world and i was the only female at that table of foreign ministers but it will change over time as more women are encouraged to take on these roles and also more women have the confidence to do so and that society is much more um, accepting and embracing. The world's in a state that we've never really seen it before, especially not our generation. What, what would be the advice that you would give to, to young Australians with a voice or young Australians who are even just trying to find their voice at a time like this? We are in a challenging, uncertain world without question. A global pandemic of this depth and scale hasn't been seen certainly in our lifetime. But we've been through periods of adversity before and through a real sense of community spirit and looking out for others, we've come through it. And I think that will be the same this time around. And I think that everybody should continually learn, continually educate yourself, continually try and learn something new so that you've got the skills and the confidence to equip you for whatever life throws at you. I have a lot of friends who are very political, 
I would say, and especially I've, I've myself been learning more about um, our Indigenous culture. I've been learning a lot more than I should have a long time ago. However, I don't think there are many of my friends who would naturally get into politics. You want to make a difference to your world, one of the most um, significant ways you can do it is to be a decision maker. Point, I always had um, quite a thirst for politics. I, I hate hearing people say, oh, I don't, I don't care about politics, I don't want to speak about politics. And that to me is, well, I don't care what's going on in the world. And I yeah. don't yeah. want to be heard. Um, and for me, um, I, I came back to actually study as well. I studied political science and international relations at the American University here um, as a mature age student um, because it was still something that I felt that I needed to feed within myself apart from music. Have an understanding of what's going on even in your community at a grassroots level doesn't necessarily need to be at, at a federal level um, where Jules got to but it, it has to be from where is your community standpoint and what do you care? How do you want your kids to grow up? What do you want for your family? Because at the end of the day, that begins and ends in politics. And Bring it home with a lighter note. We want to let the girls feel like they haven't, we haven't put them over hot coals. Oh my God, excuse me. Well done. The email that I got yesterday, the city, like it's 7am, I'm going to have a mimosa. I was like, duh, I'll be on the next flight if I could get out of the country. But let's bring it home with something, something light and, and, and fun. Who has been the biggest celebrity or Biggest whoa moment. Julie? Oh, hang on a minute. I'm not going to do the name drop. <laughs> yes, you have to. you got to do the name drop. I mean, where, do I, where do I start? Where do I stop? I mean... I think you've got a competitive advantage, to be honest, Julie, but give us one. Kings and queens and princes. See, that. that. Okay, maybe pop culture. <laughs> and, um, so it could go on and on, and then I would start to sound rather um, pretentious. So I've just had a, a very exciting time meeting people from all over the world, and it was a real honour, particularly representing Australia. So I've met people from every walk of life, and um, in the name dropping stakes, just go onto my Instagram page. <laughs> yeah. I think when you've met the Queen, then we'll I throw think that up. Ash, throw that up. Name drop when you've met the Queen. Yeah, yeah. We'll I don't think that that's called name dropping. I think that's called like that's, like, that's the Queen. I've met, I've met the Queen. Throw in a name and say, "Have you met?" That might be easier. And I'll say yes or no. You know, we okay, that's a good one. Okay, let's three names. You've got. Well, you've met the Queen of England. Yes. And was she? This should be a drinking game. Was she? De was she delightful? <laughs> Was she, um, De was she delightful? Was she just everything you'd expect? I met the Queen and Prince Philip and Prince Charles and Kate Middleton and Meghan and Harry. Yep, met them all. Ooh. Okay, well, I think that's that's mic drop there. You've met you every single one. The Queen's Corgi. <laughs> the Corgis. Not, not like close, anyway. Uh, it's a similar run sheet. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in LA for a really long time with um, the director Brett Ratner and when I first met Brett um, he invited me to his birthday and I, I walked into the house and the maid was like can you take off your shoes and I was like dressed to the nines and I was like what my outfit you know such a vulnerable moment when you have to be you know without shoes in someone's remember, home it's a remember the, remember the scene in sex in the city when the Jimmy yes was? yes oh. Yes, exactly. He had said that it was going to be like a really intimate dinner, just, you know, 30 of his closest friends. And I walked in and it was Mick Jagger and Warren Beatty, Eddie Murphy, um, Paris Hilton. Okay, so that's the one. You got me on Paris Hilton. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> that for me is like... <laughs> the star group, Marilyn Manson was there. It was... That's a very, that's a very surreal very, group of people for you. I'm going to get you to leave us with one tip each. And Julie, I'm going to start with the, everyone would expect a political tip. Can you give our audience, which is predominantly female, one of your best sartorial tips? My overall advice would be don't let others define what you should wear or who you are or what you can achieve. Back your own judgment. Uh, be self-confident in your own choices. Uh, just be who you are. Be authentic. How can you instill that confidence in people, essentially? nothing's an impossibility you need to take that and and run with it and so that when you're at that age later on down the track you don't go damn i, I should have given that a try thank you so much